Hi everyone, um, this is just a video about vision techniques and growth mindset and some of the things that I'd like you to think about doing and some of the things that you shouldn't do um, in, in terms of making mistakes with your revision and your growth mindset as well. Um, I'll be posting this uh, as part of the um, progress day on Thursday for year 12, but also year 13, you can have a look at it as well because it's really important. Um, I'd normally do this with parents and students um, as part of an evening when we look at revision techniques and growth mindset. But obviously for COVID reasons, we can't do that at the moment. Um, but if you do have any questions afterwards, please do watch it back or, or come and ask me and I will go through things with you. Um, and I hope you enjoy all of this. First thing I'd like you to do um, is a simple thing, which is to basically have a look at the picture that you've got in front of you and spend just 36 seconds taking it in, okay? At this point, you can probably pause the video. I'm not going to leave it for 30 seconds. Pause the video, keep it in your mind, keep it in front of you for 30 seconds. Um, and once you have done that, the next slide comes on. So pause it now. Okay, so you've had your 30 seconds. I'd now like you to draw a picture of the house you've just been shown, okay? And you've just got two minutes to do that, but you're not allowed to look back at the drawing from before. So don't go back on the video. Don't check it out again. Don't go have a look again. Just basically try and draw it and remember as many details as you can without going back to have a look. So piece of paper, a pencil or a pen, and you've got two minutes to do it. And again, you pause the video for two minutes and I'll move on to the next slide and come back in two minutes time and we'll then go through it. Pause it now. Okay, so we're back onto the original picture and you can see there, you can compare what you've drawn with what you can see on the screen. And what I'd like you to do, is give yourself a little bit of a critique in terms of what have you drawn, okay? What details have you included? What things have you missed? What things could you have included? And what could you have done to be better? Okay, so again, give yourself just two minutes to have a look at the picture that's back in front of you. Look at what you've drawn, have a think about what you've drawn, and give yourself a critique or some feedback on what you think you could have done to improve. What went well, what could have been done better, um, and therefore what you could have done next time if you had to draw it again. Okay, just two minutes to do that. So pause the video now. Okay, so we're back on. You've spent a little bit of time drawing. Um, some of you will have felt comfortable about that and some of you won't have felt comfortable about that. And that depends upon what kind of mindset you have, okay? We don't have anybody who does A-level art here, so in order for you to be able to draw that picture accurately and really well to make it to look exactly like it does on the screen, you would have had to be pretty skilled. And I suspect that most of you weren't. The question then becomes is when you give yourself a bit of critique, critique and feedback, what your attitude to that would be. And do you have a growth mindset? or do you have a fixed mindset, depending upon the feedback that you get? Also, how did you feel when you did it? Did you enjoy the challenge of being able to draw something? Did you not enjoy it? Did you say to yourself, I'm a rubbish drawer, so I can't do it? Would you like being told that I tried hard if somebody gave you some feedback? Would you like being told you're a good drawer? Would you think, well, somebody else who draws next to me was worse than I were? Did you just not do it and gave up because you couldn't do it? Were you bad at it but, but carried on and persevered? Were you frustrated that you couldn't draw it that well? Or again, did you just think the person next to you doing it or somebody else would be worse at doing it than you were? Because all of these give a clue as to whether you have a fixed or a growth mindset when it comes to feedback and being able to do things. So what was it that stopped you being able to draw the perfect picture? Was it your understanding of what the picture was? Did you not get it? Could you not remember what it looked like? That's a big deal. That's called knowledge, recall. That's really important as well as the understanding. Or did you not have the skills to be able to draw it? Does your skill set not allow you to be able to draw that picture very well? And that's called the application. So the big part of the drawing and also the big part of your A-levels that you are doing is do you understand it? Do you have the memory or the recall or the knowledge? And do you have the application that goes with that when it goes on to the exam questions? Because that is exactly the same thing you've just experienced by doing that drawing. One of those things has got in the way of you being able to draw it perfectly and getting an A star on it effectively. So back to the fixed or growth mindset. If you are the kind of person who makes excuses and said, I can't do it, I'm rubbish at drawing, then you've got a fixed mindset and you need to change that. 
if you're the kind of person who blames somebody else, if you're the kind of person who likes to be told they've done well, but not be given anything that's critical or any advice that they don't like, then again, you've got a fixed mindset. If you're somebody who believes that you're born smart and you don't get any smarter, you've got a fixed mindset. Or if you think you could get better, okay? And it's that thing about could get better and therefore what do I do to get better that really matters about your A-levels as well as you drawing that piece of art that you've just done there as well, okay? So you might have been frustrated and you might not enjoy doing it, but the bottom line, the end is, um, are you prepared to do something a bit different to get better at doing it, okay? Um, and I think that's a really big deal when it comes to A-levels as well. So doing your fixed mindset or your growth mindset makes a massive difference as to whether you cope with your A-levels or give up and decide it's just not for you. So we're going to have a look at a video now that shows some feedback um, to some students who've been doing some drawing as well, but they're very young. And notice what happens during this process. This is a story called Austin's Butterfly. And it's a true story about a first grade boy, and his name is Austin, and he goes to school, or used to go to school, in a town called Boise, Idaho. And in his class in Boise, Idaho, they were studying butterflies, and he had to do a project. His job in first grade was to draw a butterfly, and this is the butterfly that he picked. Austin had to use this photograph as his model, and he had to draw an accurate scientific drawing of this butterfly. This is called a tiger swallowtail. I knew it! Did, can you tell Toby why it's called tiger? Because it kind of has the stripes of the tiger yeah. right there. Good. So here was Austin's job. He was supposed to do a scientific drawing of that butterfly. But remember, Austin was only in first grade. And you know what he did? He forgot to look like a scientist carefully. He got his paper, and he just started to draw the image of a butterfly that he had in his head. And he wasn't looking like a scientist, and so this is what he drew. Whoa. It's not bad, and it is a butterfly, but does it look exactly like this? No. No, it doesn't yet. It doesn't look exactly like this yet. Luckily, this wasn't a regular school where Austin went. It was an expeditionary learning school, just like Presumscott School. And so they didn't look at this and say, good, Austin, you're done. They said, Austin, good start. Now we can start giving you critique so you can do a second draft and make it better and a third draft and make it better and you can make it much, much closer to this and he was ready to go. All of the first graders in his critique group sat on the floor like you guys are and they decided to split their advice into two kinds. First, just the shape of the wings. And then when the shape was right, they'd give him advice about the pattern inside the wings. Alia, what would you say? You can make it much pointier. Good. These wings could be much pointier. Who else would add something? Atak, what would you say? About the angle, because not to be mean about yes. the angle, it's just not exact, so... Um, okay, so show me. Come on up here, Atak. Show me where, what you would ask him to do slightly differently. Um, like to make it a little longer. Longer where? Draw right. where you would do it. Right there. Okay, so pull this out longer. Yeah. That's very specific, Attack. Thank you. Jamila, what would you say? It's like, like, a uh, triangle. Good. Jamila, I love that. So you're saying more like a triangle shape. And I agree. Well, you know what? Those first graders came up with most of those same ideas. And you know what Austin said? He said, okay, I'll go try. And he went back to his seat and he drew this. Wow. Does this look more? So you might think why are we talking about just drawing and why we're we talking about butterflies? But of course the principle, the point of this is about the feedback that they were given and him then redrafting and re-improving things. So the redrafting is really, really important. So he took the critique, he took the feedback, he took the criticisms that he'd been given and he redrew his butterfly to make it closer to what it's supposed to look like in the first place, which is exactly what you're doing with your A-levels. Whenever you get an AP or any other kind of assessment is you are redrafting and redrawing things or recorrecting things to make it look like it's supposed to do for the examiner to get the best possible mark that you can. So you take the criticism and you redraft and you redraw. We call that green penning or redrafting. And it's a really, really important part of what happens with your revision process. Because the first thing that you need to do is accept the fact you've made mistakes, which is good. It's good to make mistakes. And once you've done that, you then redo it afterwards 
and you do it in a better way that's closer to what the mark scheme or the examiner wants it to be. Let's see what we ended up with. Let's look at his last draft. And what do you think? Did it come out really good? Yeah. Yeah. Let me show you where he started, just to give you a quick reminder. And then, what do you think about how much progress he made? So that's amazing what he's managed to do. And these are six-year-old students. So when we give you the feedback as part of the APs, you're aiming to make it as good as you possibly can and get it as close to an A star grade or an A grade as you possibly can by simply following the specific feedback that we give you, which is why that is really important. So number one bit of advice when it comes to doing revision techniques is redraft, recorrect correct things when you've been given some feedback and make sure that you green pen them. That is the first stage of you making sure that you've been able to go on that road, that journey down to getting much better. Okay. So Carol Dweck is a researcher and she talks about growth mindset and the idea that the brain's capacity can grow, okay? She describes about the fact that if a problem is hard to solve, you make new connections inside your brain. You're being stretched, you're being challenged. If things are too easy, your brain doesn't do that. It only grows if things are difficult. So guess what? A-levels are hard and they're difficult because you need to be able to stretch your mind, your brain to be able to cope with them and do them. But at the end of the two years, if you do that, you will have achieved that by simply going through these processes with us. Something that was mentioned in that video quite a lot was the word yet. It's not quite right yet, okay? And for many of you in year 12 or in year 13 that are watching this, you'll get frustrated because you're not there yet. But over the course of two years, year 12, you will get there. The course of the next year, year 13, you will get there. You're not there yet, but you will do as long as you take the advice and you, you redraft your work and then go on to the revision techniques we're about to talk about. You'll also notice that we do progress tracking. Year 13, you'll be used to this because we've done it over the last year, even during the lockdown. But year 12, we've done a baseline test with you recently, but we'll also be doing tracking of you throughout the year as well. And the idea is that throughout the year, you get better and better at your subjects, as you can see on those graphs, by redrafting, and by correcting, and by revision techniques to get you to the point where you need to be. So the progress for you is all done through the assessment points in terms of finding out whereabouts you are on that graph. But the in-between bits between the assessment points is the critical bit. That's the revision techniques, and that's also um, to do with your mindset and your redrafting and green painting things as well. It's really, really important. There's a very clear link between your progress and poor attendance. So this year we've got Jess as well as Helen uh, and Tim and Laura working on your attendance and working with you. If you're not here, we can't help you. That's the number one thing. The second thing is um, you won't be able to revise if you are basically not able to get yourself organized or you've got a bad mindset. So your mindset is really important about improving, but also being organized, okay? Being organized leads to effective revision. If you're not organized, you can't revise because you don't know what you don't know. And that causes massive problems. So one of the next things that you need to be doing year 12 and year 13 is making sure that your folders are organized so you can carry out effective revision as well as effective redrafting as well. What does revision actually mean? Well, literally it means to look at again, okay? But to look at it again, you have to have material in the first place in the folder that you've got physically, or it might be that you've got things shared on teams with your members of staff, where they put things when they teach you into a specific place to make sure that you weigh and get them. So for example, my year 13 chemists, we've got a folder called year 13 chemistry 2020, where all my lessons are put in there so that they can go back and look at them. And there'll also be some mark schemes in there once they've done their homework, so they can look at that and redraft as well and correct. Okay, but get yourselves organized. Why do we need to do it? Well, you being young people, um, have very good uh, short memories, short term memories, uh, and not so great long term memories. Um, you need to develop them, you need to get better at them. Um, my memory for long term memory stuff is actually very good, um, but I'm not so great with the short term memory stuff. You need to get your short term memory things into your long term memory because what you don't want to be doing in the exam is sitting there racking your brains trying to think of an answer to a question because you can't remember, you haven't got the recall. So short term memory to long term memory is why you need revision. It puts it so firmly inside your head, that you'll never forget again. Okay. 
when I teach chemistry, I don't look at a textbook or look at any notes. I've just got it in my long-term memory because I've done it a lot. And therefore it's permanently hardwired into my brain. You need to do the same with your subjects because if it's only in your short-term memory, you're going to forget. And there's a lot of evidence to say that the capacity of your short-term memory, which runs out very quickly, if you don't get it into your long-term memory and it disappears, you're in trouble. It's called the Ebbinghaus forgetful curve or forgetting curve. And what you'll notice on here is that within 20 minutes of you being told something, you start to lose the vast majority of your memory. So 58% is left after 20 minutes, 20 minutes. An hour later, 44%, a day later, 33%. So you can imagine over the space of time how little you've actually retained. This is a massive problem for you because unless you go back and repeat, you are never going to get it into your long-term memory, which means that even within a month, four-fifths of what you were told in the lesson has gone. You can't survive your A-levels doing that. It is not possible, okay? It is just not doable. So how do we get around that? We're going to do a little quiz just to see if we can test out, see how things work on that one. What you'll need to do with this is you will give yourself 30 seconds to stare at the screen and remember as many things as you possibly can. And then once that is done, you're then going to write them down. OK, so this screen will go off in a second. You need to give yourself 30 seconds to do it. Pause the screen, turn it off, write down as many things as you possibly can. OK, so remember 30 seconds. Pause the screen now. OK, so I'm back on and hopefully you've had a go at that quiz to see how many things you can actually remember. And we'll try again later on, see if you've got any better. There are basically eight revision techniques that you could use to remember things, okay? Some are not effective, some are fairly effective, and some are highly effective. I need you to stop doing the non-effective things, okay? Summarization, where you take your notes and just make them smaller. Don't do it, doesn't work. Highlighting and underlining. No, it might look nice, doesn't really achieve anything. Unless you're doing that in an exam question, and then that's exam technique, that's not revision. Keyword mnemonics. Well, mixed feelings about that one, because certainly I've got one in chemistry. My chemist will know it works quite well for us, but sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. Rereading your notes is a typical thing that people do. Have you revised? Yes. What did you do? I reread my notes. It doesn't work. It's not going to put things into your long term memory. It's not active enough. You need to be actually active about what you do. Things that are more effective, elaborative interrogation, interleave practice. I'll come to those in a moment and highly effective practice, practice testing, which you'll all be familiar with, and distributed practice, okay? So, we're gonna look at elaborate interrogation first because I said the first four aren't particularly useful. So, here's an example of elaborative interrogation, and the basic principle of this is that you ask questions why when you're given information. So, three groups of people were put together in a piece of research, and group one were told the hungry man got into the car, group two were told the hungry man got into the car to go to the restaurant, and group three were told the hungry man got into the car, and they were then asked to suggest why the hungry man might have got into the car. The students were later tested by being asked who got into the car and why. And of course, the group that won with remembering everything, the quickest and the best were group three. Okay, group three did this because they elaboratively interrogated. They asked a question as to why the man got into the car, and they also discussed it and talked about it. So, elaborative is where you talk about things and you discuss in more detail, and interrogation is where you ask questions based upon information that you find out. So, elaborative interrogation is really about you questioning the information that you are being given rather than just accepting it, and that is a highly effective way. For you to memorize things because you're, you're active in the whole process of asking questions. If you can come up with an explanation that goes with the information that you've been given, then that is even better still. So you might say X, Y, and Z is true because, and the because bit that goes with the explanation helps you with the fact. Okay, so a particular fact my car is red because it was painted with the red color all over the bonnet or something along those lines, something not quite as silly as that, but do something that gives you an explanation as to why you're doing it. Next one's called interleave practice. Now interleave practice is basically where you're not doing things in blocks. Some of you might think, why do we do the APs where it has to cover the whole of an exam in terms of either the two years or maybe they're just the whole of a paper. So for example, in our chemistry, we have got three different exams they're basically broken down to three topic areas. What I don't do when I do my APs or any other tests is just go, we're just going to test you on just this particular bit because you will block it. And when you block things, you only remember that block for a short space of time. 
and then you forget it and then you move on to the next thing to remember and you'll give yourself a false sense of doing well so you mustn't block them like that you must interleave them which means that you're mixing up things from the past that you've already been tested on which is why the ap's as we go through will cover lots and lots of different areas so your mock exam for example might cover everything from year 12 and a little bit from year 13 but it won't just cover just year 13 because that's not a mock it won't cover just year 12 because that's not a mock it needs to cover everything that you've done up to that point okay and those questions that you could be asked about that can come from any part of the things that you've been taught that's why interleaving practice is really important you don't just do the things you've just done it is done throughout the whole of the course and asking questions about each of those bits. The studies have shown that blocking, will, you will get better grades by doing it. But when you come to the final exams, it's not blocking. It's the whole course you are being examined on. So don't test yourself on just each topic and go, that's OK, I did well on that. That's not enough. The APs have to cover everything. OK, so mix up your revision sessions mix up your testing mix up your work so that you're covering bits from every different area and not just one area and then we go into the highly effective side of things the highly effective starts with practice testing well you know what that is already okay you know the fact that you are basically practicing the exam in some form or other okay things that you can do to practice and help test yourself well that can be using flashcards. you can either buy them or you can make your own you can test yourself by covering up your notes and trying to remember and by saying them out loud. That is really powerful. Saying things out loud to somebody or even on your own is a really useful way of being able to practice whether you can do things or not. If you can't say it out loud, you don't know it. OK, it's as simple as that. Somebody else being with you who can test you by asking you questions with revision notes, doing practice questions. As long as you've got the knowledge in the first place can help with all of that. Best one of all for me is explaining a concept to a friend or your parents. If you don't understand it and you don't know it, you can't explain the concept, okay? Let me just show you a quick thing. So what you have here, and obviously this is dependent upon chemistry, but it comes through from all of the subjects that you've got. I think that might be backwards for you. But basically it says revision cards. And for each of the sections you've got in chemistry, there are a set of questions on one side and the answers on the back. So that's what I mean by flashcards. And for many subjects, you can buy those online. You can buy these, for example, on Amazon, and they're really, really useful. It can be quite powerful for you to use as well. So research has shown this is a highly effective way of improving learning because you are active in the process and you are testing your memory, you're testing your explanations, and you're able to have a conversation with somebody else at the same time. So a really powerful way of doing things. Distributive practice is where, again, you are doing things over a long period of time. So ask yourself this question, where are you on this grid? Where are you on this line? Are you no revision, cramming, revising the material more than once, or distributive practice? So 10 seconds to decide, just pause the video, make your mind up. Pause it now. Okay, so you've come to a decision where you are on here. Let's have a look, okay? If you go back onto this particular bit on here, if you are cramming, you are doing it the night before or a couple of days before. Recipe for disaster. Your short-term memory is rubbish. Things will leak out the other side. Literally, you'll put things in your head, will pop back out again. Revising the material more than once is really effective, but there's a minimum number of times you should do that, okay? That should be at least 10 times. So the forgetful curve kicks in at this point. 10 times to revise something over a period of time is the minimum you should be doing it to make things go into your long-term memory to avoid that forgetful curve, okay? If you distribute your practice, in other words, you do a bit of different things all the time, that's how you get things into your long-term memory. So don't just do topic A one week, topic B the next week, topic C the week after. Do topic A one week with a little bit of B, and the next week do topic B with a little bit of C, and the week after do a little bit of topic A with B and C, and so on. So you're distributing your revision over a long period of time and also you are repeating it. Repetition is really, really important. That is a key thing that you have to do. If you don't repeat things, it won't go into your long-term memory. And distribute that over the two years. Don't do what year 13 did last year and then they got themselves in a bit of a pickle because unfortunately we went into lockdown in March and some of them had left it by not doing any distributed practice until that point. And then they realized they didn't really know their stuff and time was running out. Start now, sort it out now and do something every day. 
I like to talk about a 20 mile march. The 20 mile march is where you march 20 miles every single day, which means you do the same amount of revision and homework and RS work every single day so that every single day you're getting your distributed practice up. Don't try and do 50 miles one day and none the next. You wear yourself out, it doesn't work, okay? A 50 mile march is really important. So, in summary, elaborative interrogation is active mental processing of material asking questions. Practice testing is testing yourself or somebody else testing you for you and you explaining things. Interleave practice means that you're doing it on new material as well as old material as well. And don't forget that if you are going to distribute the whole thing over a long period of time, that is also really important. Okay. So distributed practice over a long period of time incorporates your elaborative interrogation, your practice testing and your interleave practice. Those things are really, really important. Okay. If you've got your friends or your parents involved, so I've put on here some ideas about what you can do. Okay, so elaborative interrogation is where you get them to ask you questions. It might be from the revision cards or it might be somewhere else and you can then answer them or have a conversation with them. The practice testing is where you've got somewhere perhaps free on your own to test yourself. Maybe you can record things on your phone and then play it back and then see if you can say them out loud or maybe you're going to do an exam papers or maybe you're going to cover part of your paper and see if you can write it out afterwards. Interleave practice where you do different bits of different things throughout the week rather than just doing one, one subject. And also don't forget that a revision timetable is important, but really the big deal on this one is your revision timetable is every single week. The 20 mile march, you're doing the same things every single day to make sure that you get yourself in a good place within the, the two years or the one year you've got for your course. Okay, And be resilient as well, it's really important. Don't say I can't do it, don't say it's too difficult. What you can say is I can't do it yet because you will be able to if you follow the advice and the guidance about the growth mindset and about the different techniques that you can involve uh, involving revision as well. So please, please watch this back as much as you need to do and think about those different techniques. And if you want, need a bit more help and advice as well as watching this video, please come and see me and I'll show you the kinds of things you can do. I know myself and I've had students in my, my office where I've asked them to do different kind of revision techniques where they put post-it notes around the, the actual room, rather than writing stuff down, they've been able to close their eyes after they've read it, walk out of the room, and five minutes later they could say it out loud what was on the post-it notes on the wall. And that was much better for them than just simply writing stuff down on a piece of paper in a book, okay? So that's really important. And here's a quote for you all, which is really important, which is that memory is the residue of thought. Mm -hmm. When you think about things, when you understand them, when you discuss them, when you talk about them, when you explain them, it will go into your memory. You will have a long-term memory of things that you've discussed and talked about. Things that you don't think about, you won't remember. So it's really important that you are active with your revision and don't just read or don't just rewrite or don't just underline. They're not active enough for you to be able to do. Okay, good luck reading this or watching this rather uh, and I hope it all goes well on your next test that you have to do.